Joining me is the panel, Liberal Senator James Patterson and, and Labor Senator Kimberly Kitching. Kimberly, um, Hi, Andy. thank you so much for your time. I've got to start with you. Emergency, <laughs> what exactly is the emergency that you see? Well, remember the, um, you know, there is a view that climate change is happening. Uh, 99 out of 100 scientists, you know... Oh, uh, don't tell me that. that. Discredited um, figure, and, please. And, Andrew, we are not the 99. only... You know, the UK <laughs> government has declared... The UK government has declared a climate emergency. Um, so Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary, has said there is a climate emergency. Uh, Canada has... Um, even Pope Francis in June this year uh, declared there was a climate emergency. And in fact, Simon Birmingham this afternoon on David Spears' program on Sky said there was a, you know, that it was a, a critical time for the world and um, that there was a, a crisis happening in climate change. So uh, I'm paraphrasing oh, Kimberly, but Simon But surely there, but you don't agree with this that nonsense. Is, that is, I know well, you. You can't well, agree with this but, nonsense. But we know from the, from, in fact, from the portfolio budget statement in, in, in the environment portfolio that the government itself is acting on climate change and, in fact, spending billions of dollars. And not oh, only through the, the Department me. of the Environment. You're correct. Kimberly, well, you're the correct, Department but I'd better go to James. But through agencies, through the agencies no, look, as well. Look, you're correct, but, uh, but uh, James, you know, there is actually a medical phenomenon. Uh, mass hysteria where one person thinks, you know, oh my God, you know, I smell something poisonous and they faint at someone else. And, and what Kimberly was describing was a form of uh, mass hysteria because the Pope gets a chill, uh, an attack of it, someone else does too. Or do you actually think there's a climate emergency? Andrew, tonight my thoughts and prayers are going out to poor old Joel Fitzgibbon. Uh, he has had a tough week <laughs> by media reports and if we're, you and I aren't members of a Labor caucus, so we didn't attend their faction meeting yesterday or their caucus meeting today, uh, but by all reports he's had a tough time and if we're wondering whether he's persuaded any of his colleagues, the fact that the Labor Party is going to support a climate emergency uh, motion is, is pr pretty good evidence that he's not been successful. The truth is though, um, how was Joel going to succeed? Because all the people in the Labor Party who might share his views lost their seats at the last election and all the people that they want to win the votes back of, for example, in the state of Queensland, weren't there to have their voices heard in the Labor caucus because it's dominated now by an inner city left wing elite that is totally out of touch with the people that the Labor Party used to represent uh, in the regions. If you're a coal miner, they've sent a very strong signal to you today. Now, and Kimberly, I'm going to stop uh, teasing you because I want to. I want to get to a point here. I'll stop. I'll stop yes. niggling you because uh, James has actually raised a really interesting question for Labor as you deal with you know this shock loss. I mean, uh, Joel Fitzgibbon is saying, look, you know, Labor lost again because they, they demanded too much of voters with their global warming policies. You've got to turn, you know, bring them back. You've got now others in the party, like Mark Butler, saying, no, let's have a climate emergency and going exactly the opposite way. Where do you fit in all this? Well... I just want to make a point that across political parties there are, you know, the Liberal Party has a wide variety of views on mm. climate change. And in fact, if you looked at Josh Frydenberg's material in the last federal campaign, you would see that it may as well have been written by an intern in Richard Di Natale's office. Um, you know, it was very pro very pro-climate pro change, as was the campaign in Higgins, because the, the Liberal Party knows uh, as well as anyone, that there is a wide variety of views within their party room and also in yeah, those seats they have to that, that's a nice to point. those voters. That was a very nice point well made, but where think... are you between uh, Joel Fitzgibbon saying the le lesson of the election was cool it and uh, Mark Butler saying no and going hard, declare an emergency? Well, I, I actually wonder, Andrew, if there should be an agreed methodo me methodology on the costing of climate change and the costing of policies. And by that I mean agreed because it is we are incapable of having a proper debate about this without the scare and alarm tactics that the government runs on this. And so I think that oh, there well. needs to be a methodology, a methodology, a methodology agreed to. Emotion. Because remember, remember McGibbon's report was, you know, was yeah, astronomical. Got that. Now, can we go to and James? James, what's he saying? 
Uh, the, the scare James? and alarm tactics, I, mean, I cannot believe those words are coming out of Kimberley's mouth when uh, the Labor Party decided true. today to vote for a climate emergency motion. Um, I mean, the scare and alarm tactics in this debate are all on the one side of this debate, and those are the people saying that you can't have children and that we're about to face a mass extinction event and our civilization is about to collapse because of climate change. That's the scare tactics in this debate, and a responsible, mature political party that aspires to represent the majority of Australians should utterly reject that kind of rhetoric, not endorse it. But James, you know, my question the for the government is, this is so them. over the top, this is so over the top, you know, you, because you, you're right, the, uh, the nine newspapers were in, interviewing women without any shadow of a doubt, you know, saying we can't have children because uh, they'll die of global warming. Um, why doesn't the government start actually nailing some of the more exaggerated claims to try and cool down the hysteria? Well, Andrew, we never have the opportunity on your show or any other. I try to do so, and I encourage my colleagues to do so too, because actually I think there's real harm being done to particularly young people and their mental health by these really seriously alarmist uh, you know, claims are being made. Uh, yes, climate change is a challenge, but it's one that's very manageable. Humanity is amazingly resilient and creative thing. We have survived much serious, more serious challenges in our history, like world wars, uh, than this, and we'll certainly be able to overcome this with technology, um, you know, and, and we, it's well within our wheelhouse to do that. Yeah, but I think we're perhaps uh, tackling the hysteria would be a very, very good place to start. Uh, Kimberly, the Greens today were also calling for a declaration of a climate emergency, they today to publicise this inflated a hot air balloon using a gas flame to publicise what it, this climate emergency, which I would have thought involved, I don't know, wind power or something or everyone blowing into it or I don't know, using gas. <laughs> Hypocrisy? <laughs> The Greens do have a lot of hot air. They do, they do. The Greens do have a lot of hot air, Andrew. So they Very may well good. have been able to inflate that balloon. <laughs> yeah, but why? But how come the Greens don't see that inflating a balloon with gas, a carbon, you know, emitting gas, is actually exactly the opposite message to the one they wanted to publicise? Well, I think they should follow Jared Henderson's suggestion and use carrier pigeons, <laughs> as he suggested in the... I see you're, you're a bit leery about getting too much into them. But, James, I mean, you know, they say, oh, look, we've offset, we've done offsets for this gas, we've planted extra trees. But my answer is, if it's a climate emergency, plant the trees, don't use the gas. Then the planet's actually better off. I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure Richard Dantali says the fossil fuels needs to stay in the ground. Well, it ain't staying in the ground if you're shooting it up a hot air balloon. It's going into the atmosphere. So it's pretty hypocritical, Richard Dantali. I thought it was just extraordinarily uh, badly timed. Uh, Kimberly, uh, Labor Senator, your colleague uh, Kim Carr, uh, said today we shouldn't worry so much about universities doing research with communist China. That was just, you know, Cold War talk. And he said, well, you know, don't worry about so much about China. America could also threaten our cyber security. Uh, are you uh, with him on this? Look, um, you know, the addition of toxin that the John Curtin Research Centre put out was a themed issue on China. There were a range of views in that, and I, I contributed an article uh, which was really about human rights in Hong Kong and how uh, that really affects all of us, um, the Hong Kong um, protest movement. Uh, I do think that the Defence Trade Controls Act uh, is very important in this space. I think that... Uh, I think we collaborate very well uh, with countries that respect uh, intellectual property laws and, um, you know, obviously America is one of those. Of course, America has successfully extradited an MSS agent um, for the stealing of uh, dual-purpose technology. So an M MSS is the um, security agency in, in China and um, that agent was successfully extradited. He had been... Uh, well, um, there had been... There was a, there's a case that's been brought against him for the... So um, what I guess you're saying... What I guess you're saying of, is that you are not with... Property. You are not with Kim Carr here. So this is a debate, I think... Uh, Labor really needs to sort out. But meanwhile, of course, uh, well, James... Well, I think... Can the... I just make a po an important... Mm. Yeah, quickly, because we've got to get on to James. That I, I am not... I am not... I, I am not going to condemn... That, that issue contains a range of opinions. You know, one of the things we criticise... You know, we say about yes, Beijing... Yes, from the, from the bat crazy to yours. ..is that they don't tolerate different views. Yes. We... Yeah, well... <laughs> 
some views should not be tolerated because no. they're actually a menace to our democracy and our national security, but they, that's just me. Um, James, Liberal Senator uh, Erica Betts, he went the other way in Parliament last night. Here he is. I do not condemn the Chinese people, but I do condemn the communist government in China, a dictatorship which, as we speak, has about one million Uyghurs in so-called re-education camps. Um, James, uh, Erica Betts is one of the very, very few politicians uh, from Labor or the Liberals to use that word dictatorship with China. Why is that when China is indeed a dictatorship? Oh, Andrew, as I've discussed with you on this program before, I certainly don't want to have a semantic debate about that. China is not a democracy. Their leader is not elected. Um, there is an authoritarian government. I mean, I, I can't put it any more clear than that. Um, and I'm very conscious I don't want to damage Kimberley's career too much, but I did prefer her article over Senator Carr's <laughs> article, I have to say. Um, none of his colleagues will be surprised to see him running lines on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. But I was more disturbed recently to see that Richard Miles, a much more senior and respected figure than Kim Carr, after being wined and dined by the Communist Party in China, uh, was not only advocating closer military ties with Beijing, but did not on one occasion on his trip to China raise the case of Dr Yang, the Australian citizen who's been detained under very unsatisfactory conditions in China, uh, who's being interrogated on a regular basis, who's not being given his full uh, rights as an Australian citizen. Um, that's much more serious than Kim Carr's article advocating a Beijing line. Well, I don't think uh, Kim Carr, to be fair to him, was doing it to promote, uh, to repeat uh, China's lines, but in fact he was repeating China's lines. I don't know if that was his motivation. But on that point, Kimberley, were you also disappointed that Richard Miles, who's the deputy leader of the Labor Party, on his visit to China, never once raised the case of an Australian human rights writer who's been illegally held in China for the last, or all this year, and kept in solitary and accused now of being a spy, which is absolutely farcical. But, it, well, I want to make two points. One, the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee, which I chair, has a standing agenda item about Dr Yang. Uh, we had a briefing initially and then um, that I asked for, and now we receive probably every month a briefing about Dr Yang. Uh, so I don't want people to think that, um, you know, the, the, the Dr Yang's uh, is not being thought of because he, he really is. Uh, well, I think, I think I'm glad you made that Richard point, Kimberly. Mm. Yeah, quickly, uh, I'm just running out of time, to... yep. Yeah, so uh, Richard raised Xinjiang, very sensitive topic in China um, and certainly very sensitive in, in Beijing. Uh, and, and he also discussed the US alliance and that's obviously also right. okay. um, sensitive. So, well, I thought it was so, very disappointing. Um, so I'm glad that someone, when you say that we haven't forgotten him, you haven't forgotten him, but I, hope, I wish we that really uh, Richard Miles hadn't in China. Kimberly Kitching, James Patterson, thank you both so much for your time.